Hello class, let's continue our discussion of skin diseases. Up next we have leishmaniasis. The signs and symptoms of leishmaniasis um, depend on what version you are looking at. There's both cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. leishmaniasis. So one infects the skin, the skin generally speaking, the epidermis, and the other version is going to infect the mucous membranes of the body. Cutaneous leishmaniasis is going to focus primarily on the capillaries within the skin, and the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis is going to affect the skin and the mucous membranes. The, thankfully, the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis is not highly present in North America. It's endemic to Central and South America. Both forms of this disease are caused by the leishmania microorganisms. We have Leishmania tropica and Leishmania silensis. Depending on which one we're looking at, we're looking at either cutaneous or mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis. Cutaneous Leishmaniasis will result in small lesions. These small lesions can resolve themselves relatively quickly. If left untreated, mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis will result in gross breakdown of the tissue. Here we can see a patient whose nose has been degraded and now extends down over their lips, and they have mucous membranes producing a stream of mucus that's dripping over their upper lip because they had untreated mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. This disease is a zoonosis, so it's going to tra be transmitted from a wild animal reservoir to a human host. It'll go primarily through female sand flies. It's endemic to equatorial regions and will typically need conditions that are favorable for that sand fly vector. Individuals that are traveling to regions of the world that have these sand flies are at particular risk of developing leishmaniasis. It's a protozoal-based disease, and to help confirm diagnosis, we'll need to use a microscope to ident visually identify the protozoa. There is no vaccine for the disease, and to prevent the disease, we typically emphasize avoiding the sand fly. So cover up. Long sleeves and mosquito netting are excellent ways to avoid getting bitten by that sand fly. Up next, we have cutaneous anthrax. Cutaneous anthrax will typically manifest itself with these black eschar lesions of dead tissue that are, will appear on the patient's skin. To culture cutaneous anthrax, we'll typically need to use blood agar in a laboratory setting. And we'll also diagnose it using serology or immunologenic methods and also perform polymerase chain reaction to do a genomic diagnosis. And that's done typically by the Center for Disease Control. To prevent cutaneous anthrax and treat cutaneous anthrax, we are going to focus on hand washing and antibiotic treatments. If we don't treat, this cutaneous form of anthrax will be fatal approximately 20% of the time. There is a vaccine that can help us with preventing the infection of, uh, of the anthrax bacterium, but this vaccine is only going to be recommended for individuals that are very high risk for developing the disease or that work in the military. So we have leishmaniasis, which is caused by a protozoa and is transmitted by the sand fly, and we have cutaneous anthrax. The causative agent of cutaneous anthrax is Bacillus anthraxis. And unlike the protozoal-based infection of leishmaniasis, cutaneous anthrax can be treated with an antibiotic regimen. We also have ringworm. Ringworm is a fungal-based disease that will affect the skin. It is a dermo, dermatophyte. This is a group of fungi that will cause skin disease in human beings. It's confined to the living layer of the epidermal tissues. So it needs to be in our, our stratum corneum and will also live in the derivatives of the stratum corneum or the non-living epidermal tissues, and also li will live in the keratinized derivatives like our hair and fingernails. It's been found that all these conditions have names that begin with tina. And this is from the erroneous belief 
that these conditions were caused by worms. It's now known that these are caused by fungi, but initially it did look like there was a worm underneath the skin. Here are some individuals that have ringworm infections. These ringworm infections often manifest themselves as a ring that looks like a worm. And they can be body-wide, or they can be small and localized on the body. Trichophyton, mycosporum, and epimorphton are all the cause known causative agents of ringworm. They, depending on which causative agent is at play, they will, will have a different kind of ringworm manifest itself. And the causative agent is also going to vary from geographic region to geographic region. This is, ringworm is not going to be restricted to one genus or one species. To diagnose and culture, we're going to use long wave UV lamps, to, and that will cause our infected hairs to fluoresce. So if you walk up to a patient and you have a UV lamp on hand and expose their hair to that UV lamp, if you see that fluorescing, that's a good indication that they have the tri these fungi growing in the keratin of their hair. These samples of hair and skin and nails can be treated with heated potassium hydroxide, and that will show a thin branching fungal mycelium present in the keratin structures that are being removed. These dermo Tophytes will have the ability to digest keratin. So they are never going to invade deeper than the epidermal layer. So they want to hang out where these fungi want to hang out where the keratin is. To, tr to transmit these fungi, we typically need direct contact um, in most situations, or we could have indirect contact with a fomite being an inter intermediate vector. Therapy is typically is going to be topical and will be an un based on an antifungal agent. There will be an ointment that can contain tolanaftate, myconazole, itrasconol, terifibinine, or theabendazole. These are going to require applications for several weeks. And if they don't work by themselves, they can be combined as a cocktail to speed up the loss of the outer skin layers and remove the food source for the fungi. There's also gener or a general category of superficial meioses, or superficial fungi that infect our skins. And these are going to infect the outer surface of our epidermis. These infections typically are going to have cosmetic implications, as opposed to serious medical effects. One of these agents is Melisizia, it's a genus of yeast that has 10 different species of, within it. So it's a kind of yeast that can cause an infection of the skin. This particular genus of yeast is going to feed on the high oil content of the sebaceous glands of our skin. And it's been implicated with folliculitis, psoriasis, and seborrheic dermatitis, AKA dandruff. Nearly everyone it's going to contain active living cultures of these fungi. And autoimmune disorders have been implicated in the development of the diseases listed here as that fungi becomes out of balance with our, the normal biota of our skin. So we have our cutaneous infections that are going to be lumped together and called ringworms. And they are going to focus primarily on fungi that eat our keratin. And then we have our superficial infections. These superficial infections are also going to cause discoloration and can be diagnosed with potassium hydroxides. So concept check class. Which of the following skin infections is most common in the United States. Cutaneous leishmaniasis, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, cutaneous anthrax, ringworm, or all are equally common in the United States. Go ahead and rewind the video, flip back in the PowerPoint notes, or check your textbook for the correct answer. One, two, three, four, five. Both cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis 
are not common in the United States. Those are diseases that are limited to tropical areas. Cutaneous agathrax is also not common in the United States. Ringworm, though, is quite common in the United States. So the correct answer is D. If you have any questions about this material, please feel free to post them on the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies.